Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, we're about to get started for the program. Now is a great time to get the supplies that you need for today's activity. Um, they're already going to be put in the chat if you don't remember what they are. Um, and during today's program, um, we're going to be learning about different textiles and quilts and ways to kind of artworks that help us keep warm. Um, and we're going to have a fun activity for you um, to watch while we go through and share some of the artworks from the Smithsonian. Um, so we're just going to wait for a few more people to join us today um, before we get started. All right. So in this first slide, while we give people a chance to get here and get settled, we do have a few artworks here that you could look at um, and just sort of get a sense of the season that we're in. It's these winter months where days are shorter and it's colder outside and we need uh, warmth, um, warm things to help keep warm. Um, so um, if anyone has any questions while they look. We're really curious about what you see in these different artworks um, and any questions that you have when you look at them before we get started. All right, I see in the chat that someone was really interested in the sleigh with the people going around. And I was wondering um, if our um, conservator Leah might be able to tell us a little bit more um, about it. Sure. Yes, I'm so glad someone noticed that one. It is definitely very seasonal and feels very holiday like with that red background and the two people on a sleigh warmed up with a nice blanket. And this was actually made um, in the 1960s and it was made as it was for a calendar. So this was a print that um, was made to be to be the December month in a calendar. And it's a woodcut. So someone went and carved this scene out of wood and then printed that over and over again to produce lots of calendars. So it is very holiday appropriate. Awesome, thank you for that, Leah. And um, let's try to go to the next slide and keep this going. Um, so welcome to today, today's Art and Me program. Um, we are joined by colleagues from the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art, as well as the Smithsonian's American Art Museum from the Lunder Conservation Center. Um, so let's introduce ourselves, um, which we have pictures of us on the next slide. Um, so I'm Matthew Lesnowski, and I work at the National Museum of Asian Art. So I will go. My name is Laura Hoffman, and I work, I volunteer at the Lunder Conservation Center, located at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, which we like to say is SAM for short. So I'll also introduce my other colleague that we just heard from, Leah. Hey, everybody. So just like Laura, I am at SAM or the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And at SAM, I am an objects conservator. So basically like an art doctor for three-dimensional works of art. Um, and if Ellen is with us, I think she, yes, <laughs> Ellen's looking yes. all posed. Hi guys, sorry about that. I had, um, I had some technical trouble, so I had to switch um, <laughs> devices. So hi, <laughs> I am um, Ellen Chase. And I am the Objects Conservator at the National Museum of Asian Art, and I work with Matthew. And um, as you can see, I am all bundled up for our, our program today. Excellent. And so now um, we're going to turn it back to Ellen, and she's going to explain a little bit more about what a conservator is. So yes, so like Leah mentioned, um, she and I are both conservators, and we work at the Smithsonian. And so this is um, a picture of a conservator who is working. So go ahead and take a look at the picture and um, tell me any kind of things you notice or, or things you think that are interesting that you wanna know about. Um, and if you're, if you're somebody who's come to one of our programs before, um, tell me if you know what a conservator is. Um, you can just take a, look, a minute to look. And while you're doing that, 
um, uh, I can talk a little bit about some of the stuff that you see. Um, yeah, well, one person was curious about what animal that was. Oh, so that is, it's an animal called a tapir and it's actually a bronze sculpture. Um, and we have several different, um, it's an ancient Chinese bronze and we have several different ancient Chinese bronzes in the museum that are in the shape of animals. So like we have one that looks like an owl and we have this one. And so um, what, um, what the conservator is doing is she's, she's examining it. She's looking at it very closely. That's the first thing we do as a conservator. Anytime we do anything, the first thing we do is look closely. Um, and, um, and so that's what she's doing right there. And um, does any, if anybody notices anything else on there, let me know. Otherwise I can tell you a little bit more about what a conservator is and what we do. And I'm also gonna take off my hat and scarf because I'm really hot. <laughs> because it, it's cold outside, but it's not so cold in my house. Okay. Yeah. Well, one of the things uh, someone wrote in the chat, Ellen, is I think they've been here before and they said that a uh, conservator is an art doctor. Yeah, right. And exactly. That's something we always talk about in these sessions. So what, what a conservator does is we take care of, um, of the artworks in the collection. And so just like when you go to a doctor, right, you go to the doctor to stay healthy. And then you also go to the doctor when you're not feeling well. And we do the same thing with artworks. So what this conservator is doing right here is she's examining the artwork to make sure that everything is okay with it, making sure it's healthy. And then sometimes when things are, are broken or something needs to be done, then we'll treat them just like a doctor would treat a person. So one thing that I was wearing before, I was wearing a glove, right? And if you look in the picture closely, you'll notice that the conservator is also wearing a glove. So I have one of those here. And so you can see, here's the two different gloves. This is the glove I wear to keep myself warm outside. And this is the glove I wear when I work with art objects. So can you, does anybody see anything different about them? Can you tell me something you notice? Um, well, I see some people writing in the chat and mm -hmm. the one on the left, or the one that we see on our left, I think it's your right hand, Ellen, actually looks like a winter glove. Yep, that's this one. And then the other one looks like plastic, someone said. Yeah, a little bit. So, so the difference is, if you look at this glove, you can see it's kind of thick and fluffy, right? Because the reason we wear gloves outside is to keep ourselves warm, right? But when I'm working in the lab, I'm wearing gloves, but I'm not wearing gloves to keep me warm. What do you guys think? Why, why do we wear gloves? What would be a reason we might wear gloves in a lab in a, when we're working with art objects? Uh, to keep the art clean. Yep, right. So everybody has, um, even when you wash your hands really well, everybody has oils on their fingers that can damage some artwork. So, so most, we don't always wear gloves, but most of, a lot of the time we wear gloves to protect the artwork. And also sometimes I wear gloves to protect myself because sometimes I'm working with chemicals when I'm treating the art that are not good for me. So I want to stay safe. And then another thing, I don't know if you guys can see, I'm wearing a, a lab coat, right? So just like outside you wear a coat, but you're wearing a coat outside to keep yourself nice and toasty warm, right? So I'm not wearing this coat to keep me warm. Why do you guys think I might be wearing a lab coat when I'm working with the artwork? Mm. And, oh. So in the chat, what I'm seeing is someone said um, to keep things from getting dirty. Right, so it's, it's for two things, right? Just like the gloves, I wear the gloves to protect the art and to protect me. I wear the lab coat to protect the art. Like if I'm wearing a fuzzy sweater or something, I wouldn't want big fuzzy things winding up all over the artwork. But also, I don't know if you can see my sleeve very easily. Sometimes I work with paints and things like that. Um, I never paint on the object, the artwork directly, but sometimes if we're repairing things, we have extra parts we use in our paint. And I'm, sometimes I get paint on myself. So I like to wear the lab coat to keep myself clean too. Um, and then the only other thing in this picture, um, you can see lots of tools in the background, which we'll talk about with you guys a little bit more later. And then you can see that she has something on her head, which is something called an optivizer, which helps us magnify things so we can see what we're doing more closely when we're working and still have our hands free. So for now, I think we'll move on to the next part, but that just gives you an idea of some of the tools and types of things that we do as a conservator. And if you have any questions about that sort of thing on the, as, as we're going through, go ahead and just put it in the chat and we'll be happy to answer anything you have, any kind of questions. Thanks, Ellen. All right, so now is a good time if you haven't yet gathered your materials. So 
You're going to need felt or some sort of fabric. Um, you're gonna need scissors, some sort of glue. We don't recommend a glue stick in this case. So I recommend Elmer's or white glue or fabric glue. Um, we want you to use a paper towel tube. If not, you can use two, um, we'll show you some different ones, but you can also use two toilet paper rolls. Um, we also want a piece or two of tissue paper and a piece of string or ribbon. So for this, we're going to make our own tiny blanket, maybe perfect for a stuffy or something like that. So I'm going to stop my share for a second so that you can watch me a little bit more detail. So I have my, first you want a piece, I have a piece of felt here. This is gonna be my base layer. So basically we're making kind of like a faux quilt where we don't have to sew. Of course, if you know how to sew, you can do sewing instead. So this is gonna be my base layer. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this down and I have other colors that I'm going to use to decorate. So I have two other colors here. I've decided this kind of very pretty mint green, this kind of bluish purple. I think that will look very nice on the maroon. And what I'm going to do is I'm gonna take my scissors, that's some good ones right here, and I'm going to cut some shapes. So I recommend for myself, you can cut whatever shapes you like. I'm gonna cut some squares, got some rectangles. I also really like to have some triangles. And of course, some itty bitty pieces too. So I like to have a whole different, different scale so I can make lots and lots of pieces here. Now what you're going to do after you've cut them out, I'm gonna go a little faster, but the idea is that you keep working on it while we talk. You cut out all the ones that you want and then you get to arrange your design. So you're gonna put them on top of your base layer and you're going to design it. Here's my design here. And when you're ready and like your design, you glue them down. So I like, I move these around all the time and I was playing around with a lot of different quilting patterns. This one here, what might you call this pattern at the top here? Does it um, look like anything? So someone at the, I got two responses. One said a star and the other said they look like fireworks. Yeah, they do. I believe the proper term is a pinwheel. To me, it also kind of looks like those peppermint candies. It does, right? And this one on the bottom here, to me, I was inspired by a checkerboard. I don't know if you've ever played checkers. So lots of different ones. You can also choose to do the same one throughout. It really is up to you. Um, the important thing is that you do let, because we're using this liquid glue, you do want to let it set and dry for a full 24 hours before you do anything. So I made this one in advance. Now, because this is not just art making, it's also thinking about how the art doctors will take care of our, our beautiful mini tiny blankets for our stuffies. We want to think about how we can make this last for a long time. So if it's not currently being used, and we'll see more examples with our artwork, I'm going to show you how we might store this in a way that the art doctor showed me would be a good way to do it. So this is where you're going to need a piece of tissue paper. I've got one here. Now, because it's large and we're making many ones, I can just unfold this whole big sheet here. And I'm going to put my blanket in the middle and I'll hold it up and I'm going to fold it over. So you can see here, see the blanket is sandwiched in the middle. Then what I'm going to do is I have my paper towel roll and I'm going to roll it this around. So again, I'll show you can see here, I'm just rolling it. And it's really important to use the tissue paper because you can see it adds a layer of protection, right? In case this had any dirt or anything on it, this allows it to be very safe on both sides. So that's very, very important. And lastly, remember we had a piece of string. 
we would just tie it around so that it won't come undone. You wanna do this loosely. You don't wanna cause any sort of indentation. So here we can have this, it's nice and safe. And now it'd be very easy to store. We definitely wanna store it in a safe place. I like to think about what in my home is a safe place, a dry place and a dark place. So for me, that would be a closet. And so by rolling it, it really doesn't take up much room. But let's say you don't have a paper towel roll or that's not how you, fold, you hold up your other blankets. You'd rather fold it. I'm gonna show you one other way to store. So I'm gonna take out this, the paper towel roll. I'm gonna take out my mini blanket. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna take that piece of tissue paper and I'm gonna make it into a roll. We kind of call it like a sausage roll. So I'm just gonna scrunch, 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 scrunch. And now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna put it in the middle here and fold this around. So see what I'm doing is instead, I'm not causing a crease in the blanket. It's providing that extra protection. Now this is a tiny blanket. So this kind of already is small, but if you think about for much larger ones, you might need to fold it again. So let me show you, I'm gonna take another piece and I'm gonna make another sausage roll, just like that. And then you can see, again, this is a little smaller, so it doesn't need it. But here you can see, again, it's smaller and it's protecting all of the sides. So we're gonna see, it's a little easier to see these examples with some real bigger non-mini blankets that we have at the museum. So as you're creating here, um, I'm gonna pull back up the PowerPoint so that Ellen and Leah can show us some examples of some much larger pieces at the museum. So let me share my screen again. All right, so here you can see again, we have, this has all of the directions and this will be available later in the learning lab. So if ever you wanna make this again, you'll be able to see it. And here, Ellen are, is gonna show us, tell us a little bit about what we're seeing here. Thanks, Laura. So these are some examples of um, rolled textiles or rolled fabric like Laura was talking about. Um, and so you can see um, on the left side, you can, it's, it's more visible so you get a sense of what's going on. But usually when we're, when we're, when we roll a, a piece of fabric or a textile to store it, we have it covered over so that none of the fabric is showing. Um, and so one of the, the reasons we do it, um, is that a lot of our, our fabrics are old and very fragile. And so when you fold something, just fold it without any kind of support, you can break some of the threads. So by rolling it or using the sausage rolls that she was talking about, you're doing it in a way where it's a curve instead of a, a sharp angle. And so it helps preserve the fabric and it keeps it from getting damaged. Um, and so if you want to go to the next one, can oh, I say sorry, something? I wanted to say something, go back. I just want to say that the, the photo on the left where it looks like the fabric is showing, those are actually really big photos of the quilt that's underneath. So the quilt itself is still protected, but um, this was in a storage location that's open for everyone to see. So um, they wanted to show what was on those rolls while still keeping the quilt safe. Uh, okay, thank, thanks, Leah. I, I was wondering because it didn't really quite look like a textile. <laughs> yeah, that that exactly. one comes from Leah's museum, not from mine. So I didn't quite get what I was looking at. Thanks for adding that in. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is another thing. Um, we're talking about all kinds of things that help keep you warm today, right? So we're talking a lot about blankets and we're making blankets, but, but what are some other things that help keep us warm outside? We already talked about them, right? So these are coats. This is a robe. This is actually the same one. And the one, um, you can see it's got different fabric on the inside and the outside. The one on the left, it's open up. And um, so there are lots of different layers and it's kind of quilted, but it's a quilted jacket or a layered, you know, different layers of the jacket. And then for us to store that one, we don't really, we wouldn't really want to roll up a coat in the same way. So if you look on the right, you can kind of see there's a big fluffy white pillow in there. Um, and that's kind of a little bit like the sausage roll that Laura was talking about, but it's actually a stuffed fabric pillows made specially just for this coat to help support it. And it goes in it to keep it from folding. Um, 
on, along the edges. Um, and if we're lucky enough that we have enough space, we can actually store it with the arms open. But if we had to fold the arms in, we would probably put a sausage roll at the shoulder and then fold the arm over it. Um, but that just gives you a little bit of an idea of different ways that we use the same ideas that Laura was just showing you, but we store our objects in the museum. Um, so I, if you wanna go on to the next one, we can talk about a few more pieces. So these are two, um, <coughs> sorry, um, these are two quilts that are in our collection. And you can see they're made in different ways. Um, just take a look at them and, and tell me what you think and see, see some things, tell me some things that you notice about these two quilts. And then we can talk about how we take care of them. Similar to the, what I just showed you. Okay, we've got, just got our first comment. And someone was really drawn to the blue in the other one. It made them think of like blue jeans or like corduroys. Mm-hmm. Cool. So the one on the right, the blue one, that is actually um, made from recycled pieces of fabric. And they're, they're dyed with a kind of dye called indigo. The blue is indigo, which is the same color um, dye that is used to make blue jeans. So you're right, that's a very good connection. Um, and so this is actually from uh, a northeastern part of Japan where it gets too cold and they can't really grow cotton, which is what this is made out of. So these are actually um, things like, like rags. And if you look closely, you can see there's part of a, um, part of a flower bag and there are all kinds of different things that became a part. This is a cover. This isn't actually a full quilt. It's just the cover for the quilt, but they used lots of different, they came from lots of different places and they sewed them together to make the quilt cover. And you can also see, see how some of them look a little bit more stained and, and um, dirty. And so that's something where that's part of, probably they were already stained and dirty before the quilt was made, but also that was part of the use of the quilt when it was being used um, at the time it was in its com community. It just went back to the other, um, yeah, thanks. So, so that's something where we, we wanna make sure things are not, dirty because that's a better way to keep them safe, but also if something tells the story of the quilt and the history of the quilt, then, then we'll leave that in place. So that's an interesting one for two reasons. Um, and then the quilt on the left is um, also, it's made in, it's also made of cotton, but it's made in a different way. It's called applique. It has pieces that are cut out and sewn on top, kind of like what you're doing for your project, but with sewing instead of with glue. And so for each of these, we would do the same kind of rolling thing to store them and because these are big, right? So it's not like we could just put it in a little box and put it in a drawer. So, so rolling, um, rolling fabrics or textiles is how we can keep them safe and covered and not crush them um, when they're too big to just put in a box flat. Um, so, and I guess we can go to the next one. And then Leah's gonna tell you about these. Great, thank you, Ellen. Yes, these two quilts are from the collection of the museum where I work at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. So they're both from the United States and they're both, you can probably see pretty different, but also have some similarities. So as you start to look at them, what do you think about the colors of these quilts? And at the same time, you're looking for different colors, throw them in the chat if you can think of them. What about the shapes? What kinds of different shapes do you see that make up these quilts? There's lots of different kinds of shapes going on. Um, people notice two things. You have two things in the chat. The first where people notice the leaves and then the other person says there's like squares. Good job, yes. Yep, especially on the one on the left that is more of a blue or teal color. There's lots of squares happening. And both of these quilts, overall, their whole shape is a square. And on the left, all of the parts that make up the quilt are also square. But the one on the right, that's more of a reddish color, there's all kinds of shapes going on. She used lots of triangles and what is else? An octagon, there's shapes with eight sides. So a very more complex shapes. Um, so yes, good job. So the one on the left is actually really interesting to talk about with the quilt that Ellen showed us that was also blue. This is made by the artist Mary Catherine Lamb, who lived in Portland, Oregon. 
And this quilt was also made out of used textiles. So Mary Catherine used um, dish towels and drapes that she had in her home to make this quilt. And it's actually pretty small. It's not, it was never made to be used by people as a blanket. It was made to hang on the wall like a piece of art. Um, it's probably the size of, if it was a blanket, it would probably fit a golden retriever or like a medium sized dog. So it's about that size. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And she called it the cootie quilt because it's kind of hard to tell, but some of the weird shapes that you see in this quilt are these little bug-like creatures called cooties that was part of a board game in the um, middle of the last century. I don't know if maybe my fellow panelists remember playing this game. I kind of remember it, but it might be a little bit before my time. Um, so I just remember. like, you remember? <laughs> now that you say it, I can't not see it. Right? <laughs> So she loved to do that in her artwork. She referenced a lot of kind of popular culture kinds of items. Um, so just like the quilt that Ellen showed us, there's a lot of stains all over this quilt from how the fabrics were used in their previous lives. And just like Ellen said, those aren't the kind of stains that we would ever want to remove as art doctors. Although sometimes if an artwork is stained in the museum, we, you know, well, this is dirty, we wanna clean it. But with those we don't because they tell the history of the quilt. So we would never wanna remove that. Um, so the other quilt that on this screen, the one that I said has octagons and triangles and is more red in color is by an artist named Virginia Harris. And she lived on the other side of the, or she still does. She lives on the other side of the country in Georgia. And she, this, quilt instead of the other one, which is pretty small. This one is really big, so it could definitely fit on like a human bed. It's really big, but just like the other quilt was never meant to be used as a blanket and was just meant to hang on the wall like a piece of art. Um, and Virginia was inspired by origami, the Japanese art of paper folding um, when she made this quilt. So I don't know if you can kind of think about all those folds and triangles that you might make when you're folding paper and how that might be translated into fabric and a quilt. So I really love how these quilts are both, they're kind of similar and that they were just meant to be works of art, but they're just so different in the shapes and the colors and their size. So I think we can go on to the next one. All right, this is also from the collection of where I work. Um, what about, how is this one different? What shapes are you seeing in this one? How about colors? There's a lot of colors going on. So this, the two photos on your screen are actually the front and the back of this quilt, not two different quilts. So the one with more shapes on the left is the front and the other one that you might see some trees or plants on, that's the back. So take a second and look, there's a lot going on. And if you can think of any fun colors or shapes that you see, throw it in the chat. Um, so on the front, um, people are noticing the color green, both light and dark green. Mm -hmm. um, and then one person said they saw the palm trees. Um, and then a third person was surprised that the trees were actually the back and not the front. Yes, I agree, I agree. Um, so I forgot to mention for the previous slide that those two quilts are on display at the Renwick Museum um, in Washington, DC. So if you happen to be in this area, you can go and see them in person. But also the next one with the palm trees on the back, that one is also on view at the Maine American Art Museum. So you can go and see this in person. And as we were putting up, we were also disappointed that we put it we had to put it flat on a wall so you can see the front, but it's kind of a special treat. You have to go on the website to see the photo of the back and we could see it in person, but seeing it on view at the museum, you can't see the back, which is too bad because it is really cool with those palm trees. Um, and this is also a really cool quilt because it is also similar to the one that Ellen was talking about in that it used all these different kinds of fabrics and this one was actually used to be made as a blanket. This was made in around the 1940s and no one actually knows the person who made it, 
but it's a specific style of quilt, this patchwork we call it, that uses all these little squares and rectangles of different colors, um, like the greens that you guys mentioned, um, to make a big blanket that could be used. So this was used as a blanket, but for us, it's also a really beautiful work of art that kind of tells us about this period in history. Um, so if anyone doesn't have questions about that one, we can go to this one. What do you see? How is this different? Pretty different, huh? Does anybody have any thoughts about what, what is going on here? What is this? Would it also keep you warm? I think so. I would love to wear this outside when it's cold. I think it would really help brighten up the winter months. <laughs> yeah, someone said it's a fancy winter coat. It is a fancy winter coat with that ruffle around the neck and all the different colors. So it's actually kind of similar. You might see how it's connected to the other artworks that we've seen today, but it's in a coat form. So it is quilted. It's made up of all these little squares of fabric, but so you can wear it outside. It's like a blanket that you can put on your body. Um, and this is made by a fashion designer named Jeff Garner. Um, and this was made in 2011. In this one, we would probably store or we do store it like Ellen showed us the beginning with the coat with the arms out. We pad out the coat with all those little tissue sausages to make sure that there are no folds or creases that could become permanent over time and eventually lead to tearing. Um, I hope that makes sense. I think, what is up next, Laura? Ah, yes, <laughs> this is what's up next. <laughs> the artworks that we made ourselves. So this was what I made. Um, <laughs> it's a little funky. What we didn't talk about was how some quilt artists and textile artists put things on their quilts and textiles. So that's kind of what I did. So this was an old handkerchief that I painted with snowflakes. And then I cut up another piece of fabric and painted more snowflakes on them. That's what those little yellow circles are and glued those on. So I didn't have a lot of fabric to try to make a quilt, but I used one piece of fabric and decorated it. And then you can see, I also put it on a tube. And this is my final example here. So you could see, we already took a look at it, but you can see it all rolled up safe and sound as well here. And again, if you want to share with us, I put it in the chat. You can email us for D at dwrclunder at si.edu. And we can put it up at the end of this program as well as in our learning lab. So feel free to share it with us. We are going to show you a little art doctor conservation report before we wrap up though. Okay, so as Laura said at the beginning, part of this is to think about making art, but also think about how us as art conservators or art doctors preserve and care for those works of art. Um, so if you want, it would be great if you could fill out these art doctor reports that kind of help you to think about how you would preserve your own artworks. So I'm going to go through this using my little snowflake quilt here. Um, first on the form is art doctor or conservator's name, and that's me, Leah. And then there's a line for the name of your artwork or the title. Um, any ideas on what I haven't thought of a title yet? Does anyone know? or have a good idea of what I should call this? Uh, so the first idea in the chat is snowflake with cornflakes. <laughs> that is excellent. I like that a lot. I think I would definitely write snowflakes with cornflakes. I like how those go together. <laughs> and that really talks about the different textures that you see. That's excellent. <laughs> so the next thing is examination. What are three words that best describe your artwork? Anybody have any ideas for words that describe my artwork? I think that title that you described is pretty, pretty descriptive, but if you can think of other words. Um, well, okay, in the chat, uh, someone said 
cold. They're, they're thinking like of cold things. Love Another it. person okay. said pretty. Um, and then I'll just add one for myself. Um, I'm just drawn to the color blue. Excellent. Yes, all very good. It is supposed to make you feel like winter and snow and the cold. And I did use a lot of blue because that also makes me feel kind of like winter and cold. Um, excellent. Um, I don't know if you can tell this was this old piece of cloth was tie dyed previously. Um, so there's a little bit of color in the background. It's hard to tell, but there's some pinks and you can see that blue spot. Um, yes, excellent. Um, and after those three descriptive words, there is a question that says, which emoji describes how you felt making the art? And I would definitely say the smiling one because it was pretty fun to be creative. Um, if there was like a snowflake one, I would choose the snowflake emoji too. Um, and the next question is, what can you do to take care of your art? And so I've already done one thing, which is to put it on a roll. And I left it uncovered on the top so that we could see it better. But if I was storing this for a long time, I would want to put another piece of tissue or put the piece of tissue over the top of my textile to keep it safe, to keep any light from getting to it, because light could fade those bright colors. Um, Laura mentioned at the beginning, storing our textiles in the dark and where it's dry. So like she said, probably a closet would be a good place to store this. Um, and I just probably wouldn't want to handle it too much. Those little cornflake things are stuck on, but not super strongly. So I'd want to be pretty careful while handling it. Um, if you put a lot of stuff on your textiles, um, like things that stick up a lot. You might want to think about doing the other technique that Laura said, which was folding instead of rolling, which kind of smash anything that's sticking up off of your textile. Um, and I have mine here. So if I wanted, instead of rolling it, I could fold it, but I would want to fold it where there aren't these little chunks, the little cornflakes. So I could maybe fold it right here and then put a little sausage in that fold, but I wouldn't want to fold it right on one of those cornflakes because it could make it pop off over the long term. Um, and then at the bottom, you could sketch your artwork to see what it looks like now to make sure you can track any of the changes that might happen over time. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Leah. All right. So again, if you'd like to send us a picture, oh, it says sculptures. I, I think, you know, our textiles can be, especially yours is rather <laughs> architectural with its little corn, faux cornflakes. Um, but please feel free to share it with us at dwrclunder at si.edu. If any come in before the end of this program, we'll share it, but we'll also add it to our learning lab. So we have all of these in our learning lab along with the recordings and all of the links to the artworks that we saw here today. Now, as we wrap up, I do want to encourage you to look around your home and really think about what types of blankets and textiles do you see around your home? Now, where are you storing the ones that you're not using that are not on your bed? If not, where would you store them around your house? I said I like to keep mine in a dry, safe, dark place. And for me, that's a closet. But for you, that might be somewhere else. And think about too how you might take care of them. Would you roll yours? Would you use the sausage roll folding technique? So think about how you would carefully like to show it because as Leah showed, one day your quilts could wind up in a museum and you wanna make sure you've taken good care of it, especially the ones for your stuffies because they deserve the best. So thank you all for joining us today. We put in the chat our next 
um, Art and Me program is going to be on January 22nd, and it's going to be a follow-up also talking about cold treatment. But instead of textiles, you'll see what we are going to do next. It'll be a different one, but kind of like a part two. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Leah, Ellen, and Matthew. And we hope you all stay bundled up this winter season with your own textiles and blankets. Thank you. Thanks everybody.